Carol Ann Riddell, and this is Science and You. With Earth Day being celebrated later this month, we thought we'd take a look at some of the stories we've covered about our environment and how it's changing and how people are working to keep it green and healthy. We begin in New Jersey in the Pine Barrens, where Ernabel DeMillo discovered environmentalists are trying to preserve this land and keep it safe from the pine beetle, an invader the size of a grain of rice. The southern pine beetle is the most destructive forest insect in the southern United States, and it is moving north. Although they are no more than four millimeters in length, they have destroyed over 40,000 acres of New Jersey pinelands. In 2001, Bob Williams, a New Jersey forester, discovered the first southern pine beetle in New Jersey's pine barrens. The invasive species did not immediately raise any alarms, but in 2010, all that changed. It just erupted across the landscape. And uh, since then, it's all over and it's killing a lot of trees. Historically, pine beetle outbreaks have occurred only in the warm southern states, as the insect could not survive the freezing northern temperatures. But milder winters have allowed these beetles to expand their territory northward, placing New Jersey's pine barrens squarely in their crosshairs. I work in the forest every day. I've been in working in forests for close to 40 years, and there's no question in my mind things are changing. The destructive nature of the pine beetle is due in part to its unique life cycle. Looking for a place to lay her eggs, a single female attempts to penetrate the bark of a pine tree. The tree defends itself by secreting a toxic pine pitch, the same stuff we use to make turpentine. As the beetle fights to penetrate the syrupy poison, she releases a pheromone, signaling other beetles to help in the attack. Thousands more join in, overwhelming the tree's defenses. Once in the bark, the beetles chew S-shaped grooves that become nurseries for young larvae as well as food production systems. This process blocks the flow of nutrients and water, effectively starving the tree to death. Once the dying pine can no longer support the insects, the beetles fly off to attack another tree threatening to transform this one-of-a-kind ecosystem. Amy Carpati is the staff biologist at the Pinelands Preservation Alliance, an organization whose mission is to protect and preserve the resources of the New Jersey Pinelands. The Pine Barrens is a place in New Jersey that you would never think exists in New Jersey. Even people who live in New Jersey don't know it exists. In terms of its biological significance, it is home to dozens of rare plant and animal species, some of which only occur here in the New Jersey Pinelands and nowhere else in the globe, which means that if they disappear from here, they're gone from the planet, they're just extinct. Still, from Amy's point of view, protecting the forest's rare plants and animals does not mean eradicating one species in favor of another. I think traditionally the term preservation has meant keeping things as they are, not allowing them to change. But if you study ecology, you know, nothing is the same for very long. Things change all the time. And with the beetle, it's been in New Jersey before. We're just going to have to accept that it's in the landscape and we're going to have to use fire and forestry and, and just deal with it, I think. Active forest management and controlled fires are both proven methods for controlling beetle populations. Ron Corkery is with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and today they are using a forest strategy called cut and leave to reduce beetle outbreaks. Uh, our whole goal is uh, to try to get the tree down. Uh, it disorients the beetle in such a way that uh, doesn't enable it to continue to fly and create additional damage. For Bob Williams, who works with private forest owners, selective tree harvesting and the controlled use of fire is the most effective approach to limiting pine beetle populations. So what's going on here now? Here, this forest received a, a commercial thinning about five years ago, and then we reintroduced fire into the understory. We burned it twice, and it's ready to be burned again. It keeps the pine beetles away to a degree, um, the indiv individual trees grow much healthier. 
They're more vigorous. So when an insect attacks them, the tree has the ability to fight off things. The other thing it does is when they're emitting pheromones, you make a pheromone cloud, the, the open canopy allows that to disperse and the beetles will get disoriented. And they can't really roll across the land. So thinning really is a, a major tool in preventing them. And what about the record setting low temperatures this winter? Will the harsh cold have been enough to stop future southern pine beetle outbreaks? We know that we need minus seven to minus eight degrees uh, for an extended period of time to have any impact on the beetle. We haven't really had those uh, temperatures here at this point. Uh, we're hoping that it has some impact. Uh, I don't know if it's winning. We're just trying to control uh, at this point because we know we'll never eradicate it. While it might seem scary that the southern pine beetle is here to stay, scientists and foresters agree that pine beetles, in modest doses, have a positive ecological role to play. The challenge is for humans to understand that we are part of the forest and that we have to find the proper balance. The pine beetle population has dropped as expected, but it is a cycle and at some point can increase again. Research scientists are keeping a close eye on the situation. From land to sea, and specifically our oceans, Fabien Cousteau, grandson of the legendary Jacques Cousteau, has committed his life to studying and preserving our oceans and ocean life. Vianora Vinca spoke with him last April about his passion for the ocean and sea life. Why we should care? Because it's not about hugging whales and dolphins, as much as that's a lovely thing to think about. It's about ourselves and our very own existence on this planet. Grandson of legendary ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau, Fabien Cousteau is continuing his grandfather's work of raising awareness about our planet's ocean habitat. He explains whales are critical for the function of our oceans. They keep nature in balance and without them, uh, you know, it's like knocking a peg off of uh, a stack of Jenga blocks. Uh, you know, the more pegs you knock off, the more imbalanced the tower is and eventually it'll crumble. Our own CUNY professor, Dr. Elizabeth Alter, points out that whales stabilize the ocean food chain by consuming large amounts of krill and fish. Aside from the predator role, there are other, less obvious roles by which whales benefit the underseas. Gray whales feed by scooping up big mouthfuls of the ocean bottom. And in the process, they turn over sediments, they turn over carbon, they turn over um, marine creatures that are living in that sediment, and they bring all of those nutrients and organisms up from the bottom for other uh, marine animals to eat. Scientists at Harvard and the University of Vermont have recently found that whales also help ocean ecology with their nutrient-rich waste. As mammals, whales must come to the surface to breathe, and when they do, they often um, excrete as well. So their feces ends up in surface waters where it acts as a, a rich source of nutrients, um, essentially fertilizing surface waters that um, would not otherwise have those nutrients. When whales die, they either sink to the ocean bottom where they're colonized by an array of sea creatures, some only specialize in whale bone, as Dr. Alter told us, or they drift ashore where all their biomass is consumed by terrestrial organisms. An isotopic study that was done a few years ago showed that um, California condors in the past um, fed largely on the carcasses of baleen whales that washed ashore. Uh, and the isotopes from current California condors today show that they're feeding primarily at um, cattle feedlots. It means that um, the loss of whales not only uh, affects ocean ecosystems, but in this case may have contributed to the decline of the California condor, a, a terrestrial bird. Beached whales give scientists significant clues into the impact that the ocean environment has on the marine mammals. The whale's fatty tissues, like the blubber, and most recently the ear wax, contain a clear record of the contaminants that may have accumulated in the animal's body. As each layer of earwax corresponds to six months of a whale's life, scientists can figure out not only what and how much of the environmental contaminant the whale has been exposed to, but also when. You know, when we take tissue samples or earwax plugs or what have you uh, to learn about uh, an animal, we're learning how uh, our influences, our activities, 
are influencing that animal, but not just that animal, ourselves, because now we're starting to compare not only cognitive behavior, uh, physical uh, influences, and so on and so forth on that animal, we're also relating it back to what's happening to our own bodies, to our own ecosystem on land. <laughs> To monitor the health of whales in the wild, researchers collect samples from their breath using small remote-controlled helicopters. The breath reveals stress hormone levels as well as diseases that the whales may carry. Tags are sometimes placed on whales to determine their migratory patterns as related to the global climate. In the case of grey whales, we had um, two individuals now that have shown up in the Atlantic. So the grey whale is a Pacific species currently found only in the Pacific. Um, so researchers have been very surprised to find the presence of gray whales in the Atlantic and have attributed it to the loss of uh, seasonal sea ice, uh, allowing whales to travel across the, the Arctic Circle. While the loss of ice over the oceans and the fluctuations of temperatures on land have become a common mainstream narrative, Fabian Cousteau warns that the temperature variations in the underseas have a lasting impact. In the oceans, those variations happen much, much more slowly. But once they happen, they stay with us for a much longer period of time. And that's a big problem for upwellings, for migratory patterns, for uh, animals that are sensitive to that for coral reef systems, which are the underwater cities. All those things, when they are affected, are affected for years, for decades, for hundreds, if not thousands of years to come. Since we last spoke to Fabian Cousteau, he successfully completed an unprecedented 31-day undersea expedition aimed at raising awareness about the health of our oceans. Closer to home, New York Harbor once contained 50% of the world's oysters. But as industry and development change the seascape of the harbor, the oysters have disappeared. Donna Hanover looked into the situation in this story from 2013. Oysters are ecological superheroes. They absorb particles in the water, they create habitat for up to 300 species, and they protect our shorelines by diminishing some of the wave energy that comes in. Emily Driscoll is the environmental science documentarian behind the award-winning film Shell Shocked, Saving Oysters to Save Ourselves, which traces the near extinction of New York oysters and shows why we need them back. One oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. So if you get a whole reef in there, you can just imagine how much it would filter all the water in the system. In the face of climate change, while a resurgent oyster population could clean our water, it could also reduce the impact from a major storm surge. The oysters provide a very crenellated, detailed mosaic of a surface that um, helps to stop the wave action and dissipate the wave action. Kate Orff is a landscape architect working to reintroduce the oyster to New York Harbor through a process which has been dubbed oyster texture. Oyster texture came about because um, you can't just simply reintroduce the oyster into a bay that has been dredged and shallowed and flattened, and um, and um, it's we've 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 added these sort of hard edges to our entire coastline, bulkhead at the edges. So there's not really any room for habitat to um, take hold again. So we're working with a team. We're using this hydrodynamic model, which is a model of how water moves through the entire harbor, to study where wave attenuating reefs and protective coastal structures could optimally be placed to protect the communities that were hardest hit by Sandy. If you have a big, robust kind of reef system, then it's incredibly effective for attenuating waves. So what happened to the oysters in the first place? Over time, sewage in the water contaminated the oysters as food and killed off many of them. In addition, dredging for commercial shipping lanes destroyed their habitat. So while you can eat farmed oysters today, wild oyster populations are currently less than 1% of what they once were. I wanted to make a film about wild oysters in New York Harbor for a number of reasons. Uh, just to show how ubiquitous oysters were and how um, significant oysters were to New York culture, economy, society, ecology, um, and how quickly that was forgotten. That was just the last oyster beds closed in the 1920s and uh, pretty much we just moved on from there. 
New York was once the perfect location for oysters because the harbor is an estuary with the dynamic confluence between freshwater rivers and saltwater oceans. Oysters can't go out and get their food. They have to wait there for their food and particles to come to them. So in estuaries, there's a lot of tidal flow. There's a lot of particle moving, so they can just sit back and you know, try to get all these particles coming into themselves since they can't move. And when those particles are pollutants, the oysters gobble them up too, cleaning our waters in the process. They really do so much for our water and for our, our whole estuary well-being but they just kind of sit there. They're a very unassuming species. You would never know like how much they do. And that's why scientists are trying to bring them back. In order to restore oysters in a significant way to the estuary, you need a critical mass of animals. Oysters like to settle on top of other oysters and create this three-dimensional structure and habitat. So if there aren't enough shells in the water, the oyster larvae are just kind of going to go floating around and they're not going to find a place for to settle and build other oysters. We're building oyster texture with very readily available materials, rock, <laughs> shells, you know, there's ways to kind of um, build rock piles and seed them with um, spat, which are oyster kind of larvae, and um, to begin to sort of jumpstart the, the oyster um, breeding process. That it's very important that for, you know, in this brave new world of climate change and sea level rise, um, that we have to have a different relationship with the natural environment and with what we kind of put in a box that's called science. In addition to Kate Orff's team, more than 27 organizations are now working together to restore this vital cog in New York's history and ecology. Similar projects are underway in cities around the world. Why is it so important to you and to so many people to try to bring back the oyster population? In the oyster restoration, it's not just about the oysters. It's about looking to what nature originally gave us to protect us and to clean our water, to create habitat for species. It's so much bigger than the oyster. Awareness is a lot greater now than it was 10 years ago, and I think that's the first huge step in making change. Since then, the Harbor School has launched their Billion Oyster Project, planting millions of oysters, and the film Shell Shocked will be shown on Ellis Island on Earth Day this month. Global warming, climate change, Arctic sea ice loss, our world, our shorelines, and our cities are different than they used to be and changing even more as we speak. Lisa Beth Kovitz examines what's happening and why and what we need to do to stop it. The entire Rockways is suffering because of what's happening today. Professor Picard was part of a team studying changes in the Antarctic ice sheet. Turns out this isn't the first time our planet has experienced an epic global warming. Antarctica has been the ground zero for climate change. It has changed more than any other place on Earth. It went from a um, tropical landscape. We just found a pollen from palm trees 50 million years uh, ago in Antarctica. And just like today, ancient Antarctica experienced dramatic increases in atmospheric levels of CO2. Adding CO2 into the atmosphere warms the atmosphere, thereby warming the oceans, causing them to expand, causing sea level to rise. There were no cars, there were no us all those many millions of years ago. What was causing those CO2 rises? Well, it wasn't because the lemurs were driving around in SUVs. Today, we're throwing in lots of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide as well as methane. And the last time that the atmosphere changed more rapidly than what we're doing right now was 65 million years ago. And guess what happened then? A huge asteroid hit the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs. But this time we're the asteroid. Yes, we are, unfortunately. A warmer Earth has caused sea levels to rise around the world. And according to Professor Picard, that rise is not the result of melting glaciers. Most of it is due to the ocean warming, and when water warms, it expands. We haven't even felt the impact of these glaciers melting yet? Well, no pun intended, but we, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the ice takes a lot longer to warm up, and so there's a thermal inertia. But once that warms up enough, and we're already starting to see this in the Arctic Ocean, in the Greenland ice sheet, that the glaciers are starting to accelerate and they're melting. But what do rising sea levels mean for our cities? right now. And we've been invited by the Stevens Institute of Technology to join them on a survey of the changes to the shoreline. We have tide gauges that show that um, sea level has risen in this area about a foot in the past century. So uh, that plays a role when we have storms like Sandy. Basically 
the storm itself is riding on top of water, which is a foot higher than it was in the past. So thinking in terms of flooding that that may cause or where the waves are attacking, that's important. And we've been uh, at this beach in particular surveying since 2008, and the changes that we saw after Sandy uh, are significantly more than we've seen after any other storm. A lot of the low-lying areas on the New Jersey coast, now they actually flood on a, on a high spring tide because basically you have water coming up in the bays and actually rushing back up the storm sewers. The storm sewers are supposed to drain into the bay, but if the water level in the bay is higher than the water level in the street, the bay water is going to end up in the street. It just kind of pushes the water up the pipe. So that's certainly a product of climate change. When uh, Superstorm Sandy hit the New York City area, the storm surge from that was about eight feet. We were at high tide and then we had another eight feet on top of that. And you saw the results. We're expecting sea level to rise at least three feet in this century. The world is warming up and it's going to continue accelerating. But that's, a, that's really a problem that we can tackle. We can make decisions to help us prepare for that. Right now we have the technology to become sustainable. More solar panels, more wind turbines, more fuel efficient cars. It's great technology. It's great jobs for us if we do it. Not only is climate change evident in Antarctica, but right here at home as well. The New York City Panel on Climate Change just issued a report that suggests temperatures will rise, there will be more annual precipitation, and sea levels will increase between 11 and 21 inches all by the 2050s. And as we look at the changes in our environment for the future, we turn to what our kids can learn. From composting to recycling at the Growing Up Green Charter School, where the ABCs of caring for our planet are part of the lesson plan. I visited them last spring. These first graders know a lot about composting, from nitty gritty detail to why worms matter in our world. The worms, okay, so we have to, um, give them food so they can eat the food and then they um, poop out the soil to make um, like, well, to make nature, like it's nature's process. Composting is good to the plants and flowers and other stuff that, and butterflies, they like the summer, they don't like winter because it's cold and they don't like winter. Dirt and worms are just another part of the learning curve at Growing Up Green Charter School in Queens. Understanding our environmental footprint is an everyday experience here. Not a project, not a special event, but what educators call a mindset. We talk a lot more about um, the why behind a lot of things. Um, so when, you know, when students are eating their snack, we talk about where their snack is coming from. Um, all the people that had to work to bring them that snack, the plants that were involved, the farmers that were involved. Um, so we really talk about all the backstory behind things. So we try um, to make students understand the importance of everything they have. The lessons on going green are everywhere in the building. Light switches come with reminders and recycling is a passion, even in kindergarten. Why do you recycle? To keep the earth clean. Just about everything that can be reused here is. We have a room upstairs, we call it the green room, and families bring in anything from home that could be reused in the classroom. So paper towel rolls, toilet paper rolls, the tops of different bottles. For math, one thing that a lot of kindergarten and first grade teachers do is just have a lot of counters in their room. And typically that's something that a teacher would go and buy from the teacher supply store, but instead we have teachers using old buttons, or old bottle caps, or things from the green room that families have brought in so students see that everything around us can be a resource. What does that mean about how much salt is dissolved in the water? Well, the goal is to give students a larger context for what they're learning, one that goes beyond what's on next week's test. Right now in my class we're studying about like different types of water and how the water gets polluted and like we can't drink it so can other animals and if other animals 
don't drink it, and they'll die, and then the life cycle could die out. Unburdened by grown-up cynicism, these children believe small actions like recycling a piece of paper will add up to big differences for the planet. So they soldier on a tiny army of environmental crusaders. They don't see what they're doing as something little. Um, every time they're recycling or they're reusing something or they're planting something in the garden, it's, it's the whole world to them. They have all the hope in the world and it's amazing to watch. And can make a difference. And can make a huge difference. The earth must not be sick. Since we aired this story, the Growing Up Green Charter School has expanded from just an elementary school to both an elementary and middle school. And that's our show for today. Next month, we'll introduce you to Profiles in Science, individuals who are committed to making the world a better place. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Thanks for joining us for Science and You.